This is the panel on games and social media, so if you want to get off the airplane, now's your time. Um, we have an incredible panel here. Uh, my name is Lucy Bernholtz. I am a visiting scholar at Stanford University. I play with these things a lot. Um, I recommend you take yours out now um, and have it handy, um, just in case you were feeling withdrawal. From having it <laughs> we have an extraordinary panel here. Um, that they just turned the lights out on. <laughs> um, your, their bios are in the book, but we'll give you a quick sense. We've Constance Steinkuhler, who's an a associate professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, spent some time at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, an expert on games, learning, and society. Mayor Patel, who if you've been here for the whole conference, you've now seen 18 times. <laughs> um, he's an expert on everything the <laughs> forum is covering. Uh, in his day job, he's a vice president at the Knight Foundation, a big funder of games and uh, new media. Benjamin Stokes founded an organization called Games for Change, a leader in thinking about gaming, gamification, and social change. He's now a researcher here at USC working toward his doctorate. And Allison Fine is a fellow at Demos, a prolific uh, author whose books connected and the network nonprofit you should definitely get a hold of. Um, we are going to interact, so prepare yourself. <laughs> First question I have for you is when I say the word game, what comes to mind? Monopoly. 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 Yeah. What else? <laughs> <laughs> a bunch of philanthropists in the room. First they make a fortune and make Monopoly. What else? Canasta. 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 Words with friends. Words with friends. Yeah. Angry, birds. Angry birds. Minecraft. Minecraft. Kids? Kids. Yeah. Anybody Scrabble. Ad, over the age of kidness play games still? Are they fun? Have you learned anything from playing them? Are they always sitting around moving things on a board in front of you or on a thing here? Any other game? Anybody sports? Nobody plays sports? Just checking. There's a lot of things encompassed in the word games. What about social media, which the organizer of the conference have put both of these topics into one session. So what is social media? Facebook. Facebook. Foursquare. Foursquare. I thought you said sportswear. Sorry. <laughs> I, I was just <laughs> interpreting it. <laughs> Foursquare, Facebook. But what is it? What are they? What do you do with them? What are these things? You connect. Okay. You connect. Um, we are going to actually play a game together to get in the spirit of things. Marie has uh, volunteered to be our um, professional game player, but she's actually <laughs> really just the clicker. I'm telling you, Nancy, you could have done this. Okay. This was the easy <laughs> job. Um, have any of you, of you ever played this game, Spent? No. OK. So this side, uh, I'm not going to divide you in, in room. This is a game where uh, you try to, actually, why don't you describe the game, since you're the one who identified it for us. Me? That's you, Constance. Uh, okay. um, <laughs> Remember so, on the phone? You, you, you. Yeah, I mean, this is just an example to start off with. The, the game is simply a branching type narrative game. You make simple choices as you go through. So hopefully people will pitch out some choices and you'll execute them. And the idea is that you try to stay within your budget and basically kind of stay alive metaphorically through the month. Mm -hmm. So um, you are given, I think we'll start with maybe $1,000. And then life happens and you have a series of choices to make. Um, and the idea is to, uh, the goal is to make it through the month with money less, um, simply to survive. And the, but the, probably the subtext and the learning outcome is to find out just how difficult that is. Okay, so you guys are going to play the game. They should, they're gonna, we're going to move through the text. You have to make choices. You'll raise your hand or shout out or jump up and down or play hopscotch to choose one side or the other. And Marie will click as she is so instructed. So it says, I don't know, if I were sitting back there, I couldn't read that. Urban Ministries of Durham serves over 6,000 people per year, but you never need help, right? Prove it. Marie, can you go we'll ahead? And... The challenge. 14 million Americans are unemployed. Now imagine you're one of them. Your savings are gone. You've lost your house. 
you're a single parent, and you're down to your last thousand dollars. Can you make it through the month? So you don't, on this one, um, your choice is to find a job, not exit. <laughs> <laughs> but from here on in, it's up to you folks, okay? <laughs> it's time to get a job, any job. Here's what's available. Click a listing to apply. There are three choices. Raise your hand or shout out in favor of one of them. Restaurant server, warehouse worker, or temp? Who vo temp? Temp? You're a temp. Go ahead, click on it. $9 an hour. Position requires short typing tests. Oh, Marie, sorry. Scores are based on both speed and accuracy. To qualify, your accuracy-adjusted accuracy speed must be 55 words per minute or above. Start typing, Marie. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they set you up for. I know, I know. You've already led us astray. But blame it on them. You can type. They made me do it. Yeah. That's right. Maybe I'd rather be a warehouse worker. Why did you pick temp? <laughs> Who picked this? That's you guys. Help me. It, okay. So the mission of Urban Ministries of Durham. See, it's more fun than Canasta. You're doing great. <laughs> it's such a nice group, right? Yeah. Right. yeah, and accuracy, I guess. New York. Well done. Yeah. Click finish. Well done. Good job. Did you? Up. Oh. oh. All right. Click finish. See what happens. Okay. We know you did it. We saw it. I think you're about to be out of a job. Okay, oh. so, but you get another chance. Apply for another job, please. Restaurant or warehouse? Restaurant. Server. They want you to be a restaurant server. Oh. Oh, yeah, yeah. Anybody see that hourly wage? Yes. $2 an hour. So your average salary is $8. You'll have a monthly take home of about a little over a thousand. Your weekly pay is two sixty two. You can go ahead and continue. You got a job. Would you like health insurance? Uh -oh. Monthly premium is two seventy five. Yes or no? no? Who says yes? Raise your hand. No. Who says no? All right, no health insurance for you, Marie. Don't get sick. Even when health insurance is offered, premiums are so high, many low-income workers mm -hmm. opt out, just like you did. Let's hope you don't get sick. Please keep going. <laughs> now you've got to find some place to live. You can scroll that little house in the center there, to the left and to the right. It's showing a distance from the restaurant. The closer she goes, yep, there you go. Should be moving with you, it doesn't. I don't know if that's. Do I click on it? Grab the little. Can you click and drag it? There you go. You got it. Click and drag it. There you okay. go. Okay, so your rent is going down, your transportation's going up, your total's going down. You're now about 35 miles, 40 miles from work. Let's hope she doesn't live in LA. Um, you want to go closer or further away? Closer. All right, the closer she gets, the higher it gets. Where do you want her to stop, folks? Well, she can't afford this. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta go. You're gonna have to. You're gonna be on the buses. Keep going. Keep going all the way, all oh the way gosh. to the end. All right. As far 50 miles away from home, she's still spending 766 in rent and transportation. Go ahead. You can pay now. You have a car. So you can't get sick, and your car better not break down. Yeah. Lack of affordable housing. Number one cause of homelessness, you chose to live further from your job, your rent is lower, your gas costs are higher. If, in fact, for every dollar a working family saves on housing, they spend an additional 77 cents on transportation. Mm. Let's do one more, please. Your new apartment's too small for your stuff. Now what are you going to do? Are you going to rent a storage unit, ask a friend, or have a yard sale? Have a yard sale. Yeah. All right. But you, you, so you made 150 oh, bucks. So there you go. The whole Let's try one sad. more. 
but they raised your rent. And if you don't like it, you can move out. You can find somewhere else to live, ask a friend for help, or pay the increase, which is 150 bucks. What should she do? Pay it. Pay it. Pay it. Okay. Folks say you should pay it. Okay, you can take a class at the online, uh, an online class in uh, computer science at the community college. Class costs 200 bucks. There goes your yard sale proceeds. What do you want to do? Sign up or maybe next semester? How are you going to say next semester? How many say next semester? How many say take it now? Uh, what do you think? Next semester. <laughs> Nancy, what should she do? Should sign up, but she has to. <laughs> next year, maybe next semester. Okay, next semester. All right, then we're going to quit in a minute. Um, somebody drops a ten dollar bill. Do you give it to them or you pocket the ten bucks? Okay. When we're now about to find out more about the room than anything about playing the game. Last one. Does she give it to them? Yes. Yeah. So cool. She keeps it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like they're going to raise their hand for that. Um, <laughs> All right, so you get the idea. This would keep going. Thank you very much. Let's hear it for Marie. Aww. So panelists, gamers on the panel and folks in the room, what is this all about? What, what's happening here? Empathy. A little bit of empathy is being generated. Benjamin or Constance, gamers, what, what, what is this? Why would we do this? Well. So, for example, a pamphlet that gives these same kind of facts and information, how persuasive is that compared to making the choices and seeing the consequences of those choices? Feedback based on choices that you've made yourself. And that's one element that's happening. Um, I, th I think that what Constance just said is, is a great, there's something in, in her phrasing that I want to draw your attention to. Think, compare it to a pamphlet. I think with a lot of media choices, the question is often, okay, you want to do something, what's the right form for what you want to do? And games are still new enough that uh, there's still the, our sector is still trying to wrap our heads around when would you choose game? Yeah. And there's still a, a sense sometimes people do games because they want to do a game, or people never do a game because they would never want to do a game. And I think that both of those are totally the wrong choice. That what we need to really be pushing for is the comparative. When does a game have the better outcomes than what you're currently doing for that for those outcomes that you want to achieve? Um, and I think that one of the things you saw here is people are making choices. Yep. Um, and, that's, and, and that doesn't happen when you are reading something. It doesn't happen when you're watching something. It often doesn't happen when you're sitting in a panel unless we do this great style of moderating. <laughs> <laughs> Where I sit down here, you mean, this right. style? And, and I think there's a lot of uh, learning sciences that, that has shown that there's something different that happens when you make choices. It helps us learn certain kinds of things. Um, for example, Cause and effect is something that you often develop an intuition for through practice. And you can read a thousand pamphlets and even watch a lot of very moving documentaries about being in someone's shoes. It's different when you're making choices and you're, and you're feeling, if I, oh, if I do this, that's going to happen. That's going to happen if I do this. So a sense of causality is something that's really hard to teach with most forms of media. And I think that for a lot of social issues, one of the things we really want to teach is a, a kind of causality. Uh, if we continue with this social policy, here's what happens. If I uh, go down the street and I make this kind of choice, do I give them $10 or do I pick up the $10? Um, one last thing to just mention is there's a, the last panel was on assessment. Um, and there's a lot of uh, focus on how do we know what works and, and, where, and, what's, and, and where are things going. One thing to just mention is that every time you made a choice here, mm -hmm. that's something that this system knows and, can, and tracks. And if you think about it, our usual approach to assessment is we get to the end and then we ask them, what, is, what do they know? We want to measure something at the end. I think there's a whole different model of assessment that's in these kind of systems, which is about what are you likely to do as a choice in the moment. Mm -hmm. um, if, you, if you were to get to the end and ask people, do you remember, was it $10 that you left with that you maybe found on the ground, or was it $9? As a lot of our assessment still goes that kind of fact-based knowledge, the idea that we might be more interested in what people's dispositions are. Um, are they likely to do when they have food stamps and they're considering X or Y? If somebody has a health insurance, they could get health insurance or not. What, under what conditions do they make what kind of choices and how can we be part of that feedback loop to change behavior and be involved in policy? I, that's another reason why I think games are pretty interesting. So that's just a couple quick things that uh, are when people are talking about games. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Allison or Mayor, is yeah. there anything you'd like to I, I think uh, what was fascinating about doing this all together as well was that this is a 
game that could be done individually, or it could be done the way it is here. And I don't know if you've ever seen kids, if you have kids, and they are playing a game, like even Angry Birds that's generally one-on-one, -on -one, but they play it like a clump, right? They all gather around, and they all <laughs> do what we were doing here, which is have input into pick A, pick A, right? <laughs> And what's important for our issues is that it wasn't just watching something. It was actually a conversation that we just had. I was hearing little conversations happening as well as the larger one with Lucy, right? And uh, that kind of shift from, as Ben was saying, just from a, a text to a conversation is how social issues get raised, get shared, get normed, get acted upon. And that's what new tools like this can do for us. So you mentioned um, this connection idea. Now, we uh, set you up to do it. But because we want to talk about both games and social media, let's talk a little bit more about why those kinds of connections would matter. People mentioned Facebook and Foursquare as examples of social media. But anyone on the panel, talk a little bit about how social media sets us up for um, either the same kind of connections on a different scale or n new kinds of connections? Well, it, it, if you don't mind, uh, I'll just jump in very quickly. It does both, right? So social media are um, generally platforms. Uh, the tool sets include things like we heard Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and so on. And they're platforms that connect people side to side, not up and down, not from uh, a media company out to people, but from people producing media, sharing media, uh, sharing stories. So it's not just that the connection has been made, but that something is flowing through those connections. So rather than thinking about, I always I, I use the analogy of uh, social networks looking like Tinker Toys. Remember Tinker Toys, right? You can tell your age because if you knew them as wood versus as plastic, there's a dividing line, <laughs> right? So you have the round parts, which are the nodes, people or organizations, and then the sticks that connect them. The sticks aren't solid in social networks. The sticks are hollow. And there's something, stuff, content, and social capital running between them. And what social media does is it allows us to make that stuff flow back and forth. It's two-way conversations, uh, but also allows it to grow in trust. Right? The more that we share, the more that we connect with one another, the more that we trust one another. And then we are connected with friends of friends and so on. So it's both the connection and the scale and the content that makes this such a spectacular moment. Um, there were a lot of examples given for both games and social media when I asked you at the beginning. Um, Mayor, can you give us a sense of what we're looking at up here? We looked at one game. We just had a chance to play one game, but there's no sort of uber game. There's lots of different types of games. So, so what sure. are we looking at up here? Yeah, you're looking at half. There's obviously one photo that didn't appear. <laughs> um, these were games that we funded. And let me just back up for a second. Often when we think about games in the social sector, often our head goes to digital video games. But when Lucy asked you about games, many of you reference games that have nothing to mm -hmm. do with that. They're played in real life among real people uh, and often very <laughs> social. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> So we uh, at the Knight Foundation started our journey thinking about games. The reason we were interested in games is it was just a recognition of the fact that they're one of the most pervasive forms of media for allowing people to connect and share and communicate. You know, we now live in a place where more than three quarters of families in America have played some kind of game, uh, digital and video games. There was a lot of research that was happening around the use of digital games in terms of learning. But there wasn't a lot of research and experimentation with the use of physical, real-world games that had a specific social impact in mind. And so we looked at the work that we were doing around our communities program focused on community development issues. And were intrigued by how we could bring the same focus that games do around connectivity, human behavior, cooperation, all of those elements that make good games, and integrate them into our work. And so we launched two games. Uh, the first game at the top was something called Battlestorm. And this was played out in Biloxi on the Gulf Coast, where we've done a lot of work uh, post-Hurricane Katrina in trying to get uh, families, and in particular children, to improve their hurricane preparation habits. Now, why games? Back to Ben's question. Well, partly because the traditional means of communicating 
about uh, preparedness hasn't reached and been focused and targeted on youth. And so we experimented with a real world game with the Boys and Girls Club and American Red Cross, where it was part dodgeball, part freeze tag in after school classes where they played against a storm and the elements of a storm and how you prepare for a hurricane, like a flashlight, safe zones, etc., were integrated into the game. Uh, the second game was called Macon Money. Uh, and this was played out in Macon, Georgia, and built on a lot of the community revitalization work we've been doing in Macon, Georgia, which has been really focused on uh, helping support an area called the College Hill Corridor that connects, it's about a mile and a half, that connects the university to new local businesses that we're trying to help grow. So we thought about what on earth could a game do in this context? And we were trying to connect residents, but also trying to attract them to these new offerings in the community. And making money essentially involved two elements of a bond. So a bond called a making money bill. Think of it as a local currency. Got split in half and it got uh, sent, mailed uh, to two different people in the community. And they had to find and connect with each other through Facebook and social events that were organized in the revitalization district. When they matched, they could then redeem that bond at local businesses in the area. And so part of our thinking was, are there ways in which to use elements of games, cooperation, discovery, experimenting with new habits, on top of an existing program? So I'm curious about this. Some of it happens on computers or on mobile phones, and some of it's about in the real world. Most of the folks in this room, I'm going to guess, are a little more focused on the real world. But what do we know about using social media or the ways people are using social media and games and gaming and real world change. What can we sort of synthesize from the experimentation that's been going on? I'll throw out one thing, which is um, I think we know that uh, it's the long term that counts. And so often we measure our programs. Somebody comes in for an afternoon, and we leave at the end of the afternoon, and we say, oh, OK, now they, they're a little more aware of this issue. But if we don't remind people about that, if they don't have connections from their friends reminding them about it, if after a year there's no connection, that drops out. We've seen this; ha it happens in education, in classrooms. You know, when kids go away, go home over the summer. We've seen it happen with all kinds of different social issues. And I think for me, one of the most exciting things about social media and about some of the digital side of these games is they can come back and have a little reminder. Um, you know, a year later, you can uh, have somebody say, "Remember that time we did this?" Mm -hmm. Because they, it was something you did together. Mm -hmm. So that's the value of doing it in a social way. Mm -hmm. um, you can also have it happen. We, we have an activity here in person, but when you go home next week, maybe somebody posts on Facebook, great to see you, you know, at, the, at the conference. Um, that kind of connection, which often happens in professional spheres and, and we develop as professionals, often doesn't happen for kids or for people in the community around social programs. So I think a really exciting thing is how can we go beyond a site, an after school program, uh, a, a homeless education program, whatever the program, and take it out to where people are in the community. Um, take it out so it's, so it's reminding people. The Biloxi program, one of the most exciting things here that I thought was interesting is when they challenged kids to go home and, and document what kind of hurricane preparedness kit was in their home. It starts a conversation between the kid and the parent. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think it, what it does is it starts that conversation in a place that's not about the site. Mm -hmm. We do so much lecturing at people at different sites, at community events, and so on, and, and to me, if we want to change behavior over the long term, we have to have persistent conversations happen in people's lives. Mm -hmm. um, the kind of Biloxi conversation that challenges people to have that intergenerational discourse, that's really exciting. And it's really hard to engineer a program that does that. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where some of the online, offline connection, for me, is really exciting. I, um, yeah, and I mean, there's research for the impact of games across multiple sectors, right? So not just like civic engagement, changing content knowledge of particular topics. But as broad as, for example, changing the way in which people use energy resources, um, helping them better understand complicated systems and making informed decisions within those systems. And one way I, I think about games is that um, you know, they, they certainly are not, so, so games sit in an ecosystem with lots of other media, right? And it's really a matter of kind of making the right choices. But one thing that games really buy you that no other media can buy you is that you're able to give someone kind of a first-hand experience. Mm -hmm. And that experience, you know, even though I think that for my generation, we sort of 
um, imagine games as being this sort of isolated activity that people do with this sort of blue screen, yeah. and they're sort of obsessed by the screen. <laughs> but, but that's not really how kids and people, adults, play. Play is a very social activity. Mm -hmm. You have pointed to one way in which it's social, is people mm -hmm. are playing in a room. But the, the notion of games as sort of giving someone a first-person experience, like in the example that we used, which was an incredibly simple game, right? I mean, there are much fancier mechanics we could add. But what we've all just had is an experience that we have in common now. So it's social also in the sense that now there is something that you and a complete stranger have done mm -hmm. that you both have experienced. So I'll, I'll give you a small anecdote for what I mean by the kind of impact and social, the ways in which gaming is inherently social. So um, my background is education and being a data person. I do research typically, right? Um, and yet, when I, when I traffic among my technology friends in Silicon Valley and elsewhere, games are really the new goal. So <laughs> I can go almost to any country sure. in any kind of technology environment, and I am an education mom, okay? This is not really my, I'm not necessarily a native of these crowds. But all I have to do is bring up a game, and instantly I will have a peer network there to have something to talk about. In the same way that sports function in that mm -hmm. fashion, for some uh, of us, politics function in that fashion. Mm -hmm. But with games, you have this shared experience. And suddenly, someone that you may not have thought that you have anything in common with, mm -hmm. suddenly you have an experience that you very much have in common with. And um, in some of the research around issues like social capital, for example, what that does is that you know, in, online, in online sort of um, more broadcast type uh, networks, what you find is that people will go to the sites that reify their worldview. Well, when you're trying to change minds or, or, you know, create social change, that's hard if the only people who come to your website are the people who already agree with you. Yeah. The interesting thing about games is that games are this interesting spot in online communities because people come for the game and they have very disparate views and very disparate backgrounds. So it's one of the few places, actually the only place I've ever personally studied that you get that kind of not only bridging social capital, right, which is vitally important for things like access, jobs, et cetera, but you actually end up finding networks of people who are not there because they're all of the same political persuasion, yeah. ethnic background, mm -hmm. uh, geographic location, et cetera. And mm -hmm. so that's part of, part of what makes them kind of a powerful medium and particular mm -hmm. medium. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just going to build on this and, and maybe just reference some of the results from Making Money which talk about why games are powerful in allowing people to experiment with new habits or practices, right? They're just not going to the thing that's always familiar to them. Uh, in Making Money we found that 46 percent of the participants that redeemed the bond did it at a place, at a local business they had never been to before. Mm. So when you're trying to think about how do you get consumers or individuals to engage in different kinds of practices, this was quite a powerful tool. We then asked them six months later, uh, have you gone back to that business? And 96% of them indicated that they had. Mm -hmm. wow. So this was, you know, that was a strong piece. The other bit to uh, the points that have been made here about games being social, we were part of the interest in supporting Making Money was to get people from Macon, which is a fairly divided uh, city in many ways, to meet each other. Uh, and people that didn't know each other. In the game, about two-thirds of the people that made a match on the bond didn't know the other person before playing the game. And then when we asked them, have you had contact with that person after the game, in some shape or form, even if it's just becoming friends on Facebook, um, about 20% of them said that they had. Now, you know, that's, that's a fairly decent number, but the, the number that struck us as more important, we then asked them, if you saw the other person on the street that you made a match with, A, would you recognize them, and B, would you say hi to them? Hmm. And 70% of them answered yes to both. Mm -hmm. And that's a great indicator about issues to do with social capital. And there's a ton of research about the importance of being able to recognize faces in a community, friendly faces, and what that does to cohesion. So I have two more questions for the panel, and then we're going to have a real conversation here. And I'm going to use one of those words that philanthropists like to talk about talking about, but they don't actually like to talk about. That's failure. Um, I have two questions about it. One is, you know, um, in the play spent that we played, there probably were some wrong answers. Uh, we probably could have blown through our 1000 bucks in one click, I suppose. Mm -hmm. That would have counted as failing. But mm -hmm. talk a little bit about 
failing in these environments and what role it plays or if it's any different from what we typically think of as Wait, failing. Are we talking about talking about failing? No, we're, we're going to talk about failing. <laughs> we're going to talk about <laughs> failing. Okay. And just so I can tee you so up, my next know. question about... for you as All a right. panel is okay. when have games and social media failed? So okay. that's the next question. All right, because I was sitting right next to Nancy. She was blowing through it yep. far faster than anybody else yep. in the room. Yep. It, She's our resident skeptic. She didn't think she was going to, Nancy didn't think she was going to understand this conversation. She's a pro at it. But what, what does failing have to do with any of this? Where does it fit in? How is it actually, is it fundamentally part of the experience? Of having, of the participants in the game struggling? The people playing games or people yeah. using social media? Well, so the research would overwhelmingly say yes, right? So part of what, I mean, we say that we create safe environments for exploration in spaces like K through 12 or K through 16, let's just say K through 12, and in right. fact, we really don't, mostly right. because of the metrics of assessment that we've, um, by some argument, needed to put in place, um, by others chosen. Um, but the role of failure in a game is completely different. It's part of what makes the game fun and interesting. Um, games don't do anything until you make choices, and when you, when, um, when you fail in a game, um, <coughs> It's just telling you something about the system. It's just uh -huh. feedback. Yeah. So you can make inappropriate choices. And I, I'll openly admit that this simple little game, I mean, is not a terribly expensive or, or high-end example. of. I could show you much, much more um, compelling, visually compelling um, examples. But this one sticks with me because I have gone back trying to think about um, how would you do that? How yeah. would you try mm -hmm. to solve the game? And I still haven't actually been able to make my way through. Now, does that mean that suddenly I, I had a bad game experience? Mm. No, in fact, uh -huh. it's the opposite. The fact that, you know, in, in a game you have a, a system, a scenario set up, and you're poking at the system to see what kind of information it gives back, right? It's almost, it's the basic of science, right? You push and then you see how does, how, what mm -hmm. kind of information do you get back? Um, and unlike life, you can always replay, mm -hmm. pause, mm -hmm. and go back to a safe spot. Um, so failure becomes a major mechanic, not something in other sectors where it's something to fear, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. In fact, when I played Play Spent with my 12-year-old, he went through it once sort of as designed, <coughs> sort of as this crowd did. Second time he said, I'm going to blow that a thousand bucks first off. His first instinct like was to figure out how to fail at the game. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? I th so uh, I, Allison and then Benjamin? Yeah, so I thought where you were headed, Luce was talking about how to look at funding we're Social media. There. Okay, well, so is that what not what we're doing That's right our next now? Question, but you can go there. Oh, now, well, he like go. It. No, I'll because it's right, getting well, better in my head. I'll keep practicing. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> um, Constance was em emphasizing how, from a learning perspective, offering people the opportunity to fail is really yeah. valuable. And I just wanted to say that uh, maybe this is I don't want to jump ahead, but I feel like um, we, you we can't fail. Yes, <laughs> can't fail. It turns out I think nonprofits are bad at this. And I think foundations are bad at this too. Yeah. I've worked with a bunch of nonprofits that have tried to make games. Guess what? They think there's a right answer. Yeah. <laughs> that if you're if, if you if if you're in a program that's an after school program, you think after school programs are good, right? That's and that right. kind of makes sense. But yeah. But guess what? If you if your game has a right answer, oh, mm. we're going to show people the value of after school uh -huh. programs, and you're going to play. Yeah. And and guess what? Every time you choose not after school program, you lose, <laughs> you lose a job, you do all these things. Right. That's not that's, a game, that's not, a lecture. Exactly. Right. And, and, it's, and it's actually really challenging for a lot of nonprofits to think, can we give people meaningful choices that show them this? Yeah. You know, in, in, in fact, think of your social issue and say, is there a way I could say that sometimes choosing the other thing, mm. you know, choosing to drop out of school could be great mm. for somebody? Mm. Oh, yeah. wait. There are mm. a lot of nonprofits that are unwilling to have that conversation. And I think that games are a media that, that push us yeah. in a way that I think a lot of others don't. You can make a, a, a film that's very much about Oh, feel how this one person's experience was, uh, and it was great for them. And you, oh, you happen to have chosen somebody for whom the after-school program was so wonderful. Um, but there are some. The, the point of a game is, if these choices are meaningful, they have to be hard choices. They have to be choices where you don't know the answer. And most of the good games are are ones where actually there there isn't necessarily a right answer. Yeah. There there are consequences yeah. on both sides, um, and that's a particular approach to social issues that I, I think. There are a lot of nonprofits that might not be ready for that yet, and I, th I think it's worth just having that out there. Mm -hmm. I, I would have so you know uh, before returning to academics a few months ago, I worked in the White House advising across agencies on their game-based strategies, which are far deeper across agencies than you could possibly imagine. <laughs> um, and 
for the most part, successful. But they have the same exact problem, mm -hmm. so you're not alone. And part of that is sort of understanding there is a place for pamphlets. If you've got the right answer and you don't want anyone to have to think through the problem, you're just going to give them the answer and then revoicing the answer to you is your metric of whether or not you've changed the world, give them a pamphlet. Save yourself the time. Mm -hmm. If, on the other hand, you would like people to understand a complicated problem for which there are better choices or worse choices, for which you would like them to draw the conclusion that you came to because you think that if you walk through this scenario, there is only one conclusion that you will come to, which is in this case, I'll use the game that we played, that poverty is really expensive and hard, mm -hmm. right? That social institutions that help people who are poor are worthwhile in doing a lot of good. Mm -hmm. If you believe that, then create a scenario where someone can query that, interrogate mm -hmm. it in the way that a game player will interrogate it. And what you will end up with is a player that walks away that when and if they draw that conclusion, they will be far more persuaded because they drew it on their own. Mm -hmm. And the same is frankly true of most media. It's just that games really take it to a level mm -hmm. in which you can't get away with um, having only one track that is the track that you're really supposed to play, mm -hmm. right? And the other ones you're just kind of dead ending in a certain way. I think there's a, and I, this, it happens with, for example, there's a, a recent book on NBC's attempt to sort of add gamification to some of their assets. And even corporations have mm -hmm. a hard time letting go of control. But you know, at some point you have to trust your player and your user. If you really want to... Um, give them the kind of experience or the capacity to, to play in a space, and you think that play will end up with them drawing the right conclusions, then you have to give them the freedom to do that. Mm -hmm. And that's a very risky thing across, you know, because then suddenly you have to ask yourself, what are the right metrics? Are the right metrics that everyone agreed with you, or that someone has a more uh -huh. complicated com conceptual model of the problem? Like, what are the right metrics? And that's, that's a genuine question. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts on this? Or last question from me, and other than the fact that I'm live tweeting this conversation, we haven't had a lot of conversation here about social media, so feel free to ask those questions. And Twitter's comment on the uh, photo I sent out was, it looks like a Knight Foundation presentation. <laughs> so um, I want to follow up on something Constance said, which is most of the government agencies are doing a lot more with games than we know they are. Is that news to you all? Do you know yes. your tax dollars are going to fund games? <laughs> um, so it would be great to hear more about that and learn mm -hmm. from what's happening. But I'd love to hear from all of you about examples you know of foundations, public agencies, nonprofits doing this well, yeah. what they need to think about, uh, whatever doing this is. I'm realizing that's kind of an open question to you all, but also where it really doesn't work. And you've given us some good examples. If you've got a right answer, use a pamphlet. It's out on Twitter. It's now handed down. But let's start with you, Allison. You were going to go here a minute ago, <laughs> so the door is now open. Uh, so the difficulty for many funders, uh, many nonprofits, is that success in the social realm, social ecosystem, is significantly quantitatively different than success in old bricks and mortar funding institutions. In other words, particularly if you have an arts background, this will resonate with you. If you don't have an arts background, I think you can follow it. We no longer talking, are talking about putting asses in seats, right? Uh, we are talking, if we're talking social, we're talking about uh, building, strengthening, creating those connections and when those connections happen, and this is very similar to the games analogy, we don't know what's going to happen as a result of them. Life is going to happen, which is going to be messy and unpredictable. But the fact that the connections are made, that there is sharing of information and ideas, are really wonderful things. So the difficulty is figuring out how to create what I think of as scaffolding, as infrastructure, uh, through philanthropy, that can support the strengthening of relationships, sharing of information, learning together, acting together. So one recent example of that was Giving Tuesday. Right, we had a very simple idea. It's, just a ha it's literally just a hashtag. The pound sign and Giving Tuesday started by the 92nd Street Y and the UN Foundation. And what they did, did was create the framework for giving to causes on the, the Tuesday after Thanksgiving. And then they had to let it go, right? Because they were not going to be in charge once it's a hashtag. It's on Twitter. People like Lucy are forwarding it and doing stuff. 
And if somebody in Minneapolis wants to use Giving Tuesday as a volunteer, a, you know, a day to attract volunteers as opposed to a day for giving money, which was what, you know, the Y had originally thought, then that's what it's going to be. So that, that pathway becomes completely unpredictable, but at the end what you have uh, is that scaffolding that stays, Giving Tuesday will continue next year, are all of those relationships that have been built and can now be powered to do a whole host of things, but with a very different set of outcomes than we're accustomed to. Great example. Other thoughts on? I'll give a quick one. Um, so I want to just emphasize something you've probably heard, and, and this, this will hopefully push it a little bit further. The idea that games are not just another place to push your content, which is how most people come to them. Uh, and we have an issue. We want to figure out another way to get it out to people. There, you can do that too, but I think to really wrap your heads, if you get games, part of what you realize is that they structure participation. And I think that what, is the, what does this look like? Well, Boston, city of Boston, has an office of new urban mechanics. Mm -hmm. Wonderful name. Um, just kind of poetic sounding, if you ask me, as a games person. But um, what, they've, what they've gotten over three years, they've gotten 19,000 requests from citizens saying things like, oh, there's a pothole here. Yeah. Oh, there's a street sign that's, that's mislabeled. Oh, there's a power outage in this location. This is, there's no content being delivered. It's not the city t telling people how to do their taxes. It's not, you know, it, it, what it is is it's a structure for people to engage and do something. It's about the activity, it's about behavior, not about content. It's, it's changing how people are relating to the city. So Boston has one. Philadelphia just started an office of new urban mechanics. Uh, San Francisco has one. There's a lot of smart city movements um, that are happening in a number of different cities where they're competing to kind of be known as what we're a smart city and what exactly that means. There's a <laughs> lot of debate. So we're in very early days for a lot of these things. But I do want to push this idea that games can be a way to structure how citizens or your residents or the people you're providing services, how they interact with each other and how they interact with you. And I think that that really changes, uh, that, that emphasizes how the medium is really different than a lot of other ones. Um, it's not just pushing information, it's trying to structure some kind of activity. Um, and I think that, that that's something that we're going to continue to be thinking about. The science on this is pretty new. We've, there, there's been thinking about systems and feedback loops for a long time, but how it works in practice, especially in lots of examples, it's really just being studied. I mean, universities didn't have areas to study this in terms of the mechanics and the experience and the feedback loop in any type of systematic way until very recently. Uh, Constance comes from a program that has set up uh, a lot of some of the best in, in the world pro, uh, studies of what are games, how do they work, whether it's education or a lot of other places. Universities are starting to study this. So this is in a 10-year trajectory, we're going to be in a very different place. Um, but we're already in a place where it's starting to, we're starting to understand some of, these, some of these feedback loops as part of cities and as part of programs. So I think that's, I think that's an area where games are going. Mm -hmm. I will say, um, oh, keep going. I was just going to say on the, the question of failure and lessons learned, why don't I just share a little bit about Knight's experience. Uh, our first wave and introduction into the world of games really came through our journalism and media work. And it was uh, not very successful at all. We were really pushing on the idea of, Let's get content out there. Let's help uh, young people think about how to be a reporter and play a game being a reporter. And the games didn't go anywhere. There was very little adoption and very little traction. And two big lessons for us around that. Number one, these were games that weren't designed by professional game designers. Uh, these were individuals that were kind of doing it out of their back pocket in many ways. So that was a big lesson. This is a unique system about how people behave and you need people who are versed in this. So that was lesson number one. Lesson number two, they were all largely created as standalone games. There wasn't the ability to make it social mm -hmm. or to share it. So that was a big lesson. The other uh, big lesson for us comes from Biloxi. And it's a lesson about failure and metrics and how you think about failure. So <laughs> when we entered the Biloxi Battlestorm game, we thought this was going to be about getting uh, young kids to learn more about how they can be better prepared. So what we went out and measured was, do the children have a better understanding and recall of what are the elements that go into a hurricane kit and how to be better prepared? It turns out, no. The game didn't affect, when we did that against a control group, any improvements. Now, you could think of that as a failure. It was also partly a failure on our part to understand why games are useful. Because we were totally focused on the game as being a transmission of content to an individual, much like the pamphlet, although mm -hmm. a game. 
What it did prove, though, the valuation, what the games were really effective at, was that they were valuable because the children that went through it felt energized and excited and wanted to share. Mm -hmm. The kids became these superconductors of information about hurricanes. So 63% of the kids that went through the game went home and had a conversation with their parent, as Ben was alluding to, about hurricanes. And the other big thing that the game was powerful was it was in many cases the first time that families were able to have a conversation about Hurricane Katrina in a way that wasn't painful and emotionally mm. charged. It was an important part of play as catharsis for these communities. So I think these are important issues about how you think about what success looks like in a game and then being able to measure alongside that appropriately. That's great. Did you want to? Um, so in the games, so failure. <laughs> um, you know, in the games industry, there's actually a long tradition of doing post-mortems after game designs of both the ones that hit and the ones that don't. There is a high failure rate for any kind of successful public media and successful popular media. There just is. So you have to be able to understand and, you, you know, you have to have the courage to be able to say, I need to diversify the risk across my portfolio of investments in particular ways so I understand where my high risk kind of investments fit, right? Turns out for federal government agencies, they're not so good at thinking about that, <laughs> let's just say. Um, but hopefully we're nudging them more toward that direction. But in the industry, there is a high failure rate because there's a lot of game design and tinkering and iteration, a lot of poaching good design mm. from other people. It's an industry of, in some ways, engineering and engineering participation and engagement. That is what game designers do. So they have a great ethos of sharing what those failures are because those failures are seen as contributions to the community because you can say, I did that mechanic for this thing, it didn't work. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, his, right now in history, right now, how things are, hopefully we won't stay here for the rest of our lives, but. Most of the games for impact being created right now are being created in, under the auspices of academic institutions. Mm -hmm. There's a consortium that we put together uh, six months ago, nine months ago, that's the Academic Consortium of Games for Impact, of which USC is one of them, my institution is one of them. But those institutions are trying to address how do we actually share our own game failures so that we can create that same sort of ethos that you see in the, in the industry. Now the reason that they're kind of siloed away is to be very brutally honest with you, Game companies are not in the business of saving the world. I have spent 18 months slogging it through a ton of game industry conversations with CEOs, going to them as a White House person saying, double bottom line, triple bottom line, double bottom line. Well, you could just maybe not, maybe you could make that a bit more pro-social and a bit less onerous and frightening for mom. <laughs> it's and possible. Which all they hear is, what, oh, less? Less profit? No. No. What, no. We don't do less profit. Yeah. Right? Because they, their obligation, they are entertainment industry. Yeah. Right? So I, it, it's not to blame them whatsoever. But the reason the Games for Impact are largely coming out of academic institutions is because they're theoretically incredibly interesting. They are design-wise incredibly interesting. And it turns out that the freedom in academia for you to say, I'm going to create a game that's about hurricane preparation. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily have to have it make a ton of profit for shareholders. I'm going to measure it in other ways for impact, right? Mm -hmm. It's an incredible freedom. So under that, but, but, but part of, so that's, you know, that's just the history of where we're at now in games yeah. and more sort of um, games for impact and other sort of media, uh, uh, media attempts toward social change, impact, and saving the world. Um, but that said, I think we're starting to grow into our own some of starting to share things like failure. So now you see events like at ours, we have a hall of failure where you go up and you say, here's what we built, here's what didn't work. And God help us, our funders will probably pull all of our funding. That's why <laughs> you don't talk about it, right? You don't talk about it because you know you don't want to be the person that someone invested in and now is saying, oh, yeah, that didn't work. <laughs> that didn't work. <laughs> and you're never going to want to have this conversation again. So I don't know what the solution is there. It's the same solution that we run into at agencies. But rethinking our understanding of our relationship with risk is probably the first one. And having some candid discussions about if you want to reach youth, then reaching them where they're at is a very yeah. seductive and a very high reward activity. But in order to do that, you have to be able to execute on design in a way that we don't know yet. That's part of what's exciting mm -hmm. about this field. Mm -hmm. We're only 
only now discovering through things like, you know, the game in Make in Georgia, or games that have come out through Games for Change, um, how it is that you can bend this medium toward real change out in the world. So in order to do that, I think we have to start being enabled, at least given some permission to share failures mm -hmm. so our field can develop in the engineering sense, um, and, and supported in that endeavor because, uh, you know, no program officer likes to hear that, listen, I know that you wanted an investment in this kind of game. Here's what typically happens, is that you think you know what you're investing in, you get a prototype or some wireframes and a page or two or ten of text, and then if they're good designers, they start rolling out, they start sort of uh, iterating on that design. Game is a highly iterative design process. So they end up iterating that design, and so what they end up finding out is the better design doesn't match the primary document, mm -hmm. yeah. and they have a choice. Are you going to pull funding because in order to execute on what you want, they need to do something totally different than where they started? That makes yeah. us all uncomfortable. I mean, I can feel myself getting nervous now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. no. All right. Well, let's not let kind of get too nervous. Meyer, last yeah, word, and then I'm going to open it up. Very up. quickly, because it's exactly on this point about sharing failure. So we, we did three things, uh, and I would encourage all funders that are thinking about games to do this, partly because you can do this more in this space because sometimes your board isn't really sure what you're up to in social games. So <laughs> number one, we shared all of the results publicly. So all of the evaluations are on our website public. We shared all of the data, all of the individual survey data from Biloxi and Battlestorm, um, Biloxi Battlestorm and Making Money up on the web so academic researchers can go into all of that and run analysis that we didn't do, which many are. And finally, and I think this is really important, uh, and we learned this, this is not one thing that we came into it with, is make, build a game in an open format yep. so that everyone can take the spare parts and raw materials of your game and use them again. Exactly so all of the imagery, all of the icons, all of the badges, it's all licensed under Creative Commons, it's all up so people can pick, that, pick at them and reuse them. And I think that's really a valuable yep. uh, lesson from thinking about how you build the social impact game sector as a whole. Yep. So I want to um, apologize for the typical panel format of this, which is now you get 15 minutes for questions. But you have 15 minutes for questions. I'll give the last word to the panelists. But please just uh, raise your hand, identify yourself by name, so we know who you are and let her rip. Right here. Hi, I'm Rachel. I'm with the Environmental Grantmakers Association. I just wanted to hear you all talk a little bit about one of the things that's hard with social media and games and philanthropy is sort of philanthropy is not necessarily the most transparent uh, sector. So, uh, so th even things like Facebook uh, is something our association has struggled with. Uh, even though I see all of our members on Facebook, it totally makes sense. So, just kind of want to get your feedback or thoughts on how to bring or how philanthropy is coming along to more of this since the open part of it is important. Uh, so uh, transparency is critical in the use of social media, right? In particular, uh, people being people, not being logos, right? Because I don't know about you, but I personally have never had a whole conversation with a logo uh, before. <laughs> So the struggle for a lot of institutions, not just philanthropy, but a lot of institutions is how do we get comfortable losing control that our staffers, uh, our employees are out having conversations that we're not um, authorizing them to do. Uh, but foundations are inching their way out there. Certainly Knight is leading the way, Packard, Hewlett, other places as well, and, and smaller foundations, community foundation. and in DC is doing a beautiful job of this, of, a, of uh, supporting and training staff to have their own identity online, making it clear that they're an employee of this institution, but using the platforms, whether it's Facebook or whether it's Twitter, might be easier for some folks to get into initially because it's a little less personal than Facebook, uh, using those vehicles as opportunities to listen and learn first and foremost, right? There's a lot going on out there that if you're not out in that world, you're missing. So listening and learning, bumping into people and examples and models that you might not have bumped into, so that serendipity is happening there. Celebrating the work of your grantees, which is a fantastic way to leverage your phil philanthropic dollars, right? You don't have to fund everything. You can celebrate the work of other foundations or the work of your own grantees. 
um, and then asking for input uh, on strategy. So those are a number of different ways that foundations are using uh, social media. You have to be kind to yourselves, though, because the transition from sitting behind the high walls, uh, and now the walls are down, the moats are <laughs> filled in, and we're out there in the world is extraordinarily uncomfortable. So think about inching your way out there through a s series of small experiments over the next year and giving your folks some support, some training, some modeling uh, for how to be their own selves out there and even how to make a mistake uh, out there as well, which is to make a really fast heartfelt apology is the answer to that. So you'll That's get you there. That's what you do once you make the mistake that you're okay. going to make because everybody does. Great. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. There was a question here and then, sir. Um, Dana Nunn from the Thrive Foundation for Youth. Um, we've been very interested in games and using them with youth that, that we work with. Um, and I suppose this would also apply, you know, if you're working with low income populations. The, the barrier we come up against is the so called digital divide that we're, we want to use this particularly with kids, but a lot of the populations we're working with, and now I'm, I'm actually really appreciative of the idea of not digital games. That's sort of a new thought that I hadn't had. But assuming you're in the realm of social media and digital games, how do you, what, where, what are the trends or where are particularly kids but even other populations that don't have access to this and how do you keep riding the wave which seems so, you know, has so much momentum but the reality is sometimes you can't use this with a certain population. Okay. I'll throw out a couple things. Um, I think for like a lot of strategies you go where your people are and I think that um, one of the, there's a lot of surprises with digital media, which you've probably discovered. I mean, if you're here in Los Angeles, for instance, um, and you'd imagine some of the people on the far end of the digital divide are like day laborers who are here without documentation, uh, with less than high school education, making sub-poverty wages. But it turns out a lot of these folks have cell phones because if you want a job, you have to be able to, somebody calls you or wants to call you back. I mean, it's one of the very first purchases you're going to make. So there's, there, is, there are certain kinds of technology. Games also operate in a similar way. People that might have trouble paying a utility bill might go buy a PlayStation. And that's, mm -hmm. you can't criticize that in some ways because we're all humans and, and who wants to say that life has to be all suffering? You know, you, you, sometimes you make some choices about how to spend some pleasure time. So I think often when you're working with, with populations that may seem uh, traditionally excluded across the digital divide, you actually go and you ask, well, what do you do for fun? Do you use digital media? And I think people are using digital media in all sorts of ways. And then the question is, how can we engage with that? Constance mentioned earlier this idea of stepping back from the idea of the game just being the software or the hardware. And it, actually, a game program might be around it. A lot of libraries are, do, are looking at this as a strategy right now, because they often deal with populations that are across the digital divide. And what they're recognizing is we don't need to build new games or try to launch an Xbox game. Instead, we can invite people into the library and say, we're going to host a youth game hour uh, with some racing games, and we're going to have some conversations around this, which ties totally into a bunch of social science research around stuff like bowling leagues as places where people mm -hmm. build social capital, talk about social issues, and really engage. And here, you're not building a game with your issue. You're instead using their passion for games with people who might be entirely across the digital divide, but getting, giving a space to engage with that. So I think there are a lot of strategies there, beginning with just look where people already are. And you'll often find games, or, games and social media can be a part of that. Mm -hmm. The only other thing, and there's a great example that I'll give you around this, is yes, you should be concerned about digital divide issues. But if most people have a mobile phone, they're going to be able to interact with SMS. And actually, there's some great SMS-based games. And Do Something, which is a nonprofit that's focused on engaging youth and getting involved in causes. One of the topics they were interested in and have been focused on is the issue of teen pregnancy. And so they created a game where you text to a number uh, and send in, and the next day you're going to impregnate your phone as a result of texting that number. <laughs> and so I did it with a bunch of colleagues because we were experimenting with some of this stuff. And 6 a.m. sharp, you get a text message saying, hey, I'm awake, why on earth are you sleeping? Right? <laughs> An hour later, I'm really hungry. You know? and you, so like, just getting people to think about interacting. And because the game was on SMS mobile, um, Do Something was able to collect amazing amounts of data from this. They've done such fantastic work on mobile. They know things like the best time to text a teenager in order to get a response. 
The best time, it turns out, is 10 p.m. 10 p.m. is the best time. The other wonderful fact about SMS and it ties to games is the open rate of text messages, if you send a yeah. Tina text message, it's 100%. <laughs> and you think about it yourself. Even yeah. the th text messages you don't want to open. That is until parents start spamming yeah, that's their right, kids. Yeah. You, you're um, going to open it. <laughs> and I just want to comment about this slide. It's not complete. We, the panel had more resources. We'll get them to you electronically somehow through the U.S. Oh, there's another slide. Oh. Um, and uh, you'll know, know how to contact the panelists for more information. Yes, please, sir. Um, my name is John McDonald with Stones for Communications. I actually have two questions. One is, in the research that you've looked at, is if you measure how it changes behavior, and let me give an example. Um, last year, when California was really in the heights of its budget crisis, there was an online game in the newspaper where you could go online and you could make decisions as to how you would balance the budget. And I thought it was terrific. But I wondered, did it really change people's attitudes towards the budget? Did it change their attitudes about how they might vote regarding taxes, those kinds of things? So I'm wondering how much research there is that looks at, does it really, you know, as a communications person, I'm looking to change people's behavior. And so I'm wondering if there's research on that. I'll throw really, really quickly, behavior change is incredibly hard. Mm -hmm. And so this is something the last panel was talking a little about. Being modest, most programs can't change behavior. And, they, and, and if you actually look at it, you know, they're, they're, the changes are this big. And games are not going to be different. So really quickly on that, though, the budget, here's something I think that we, that you, where you, where you, we can have a difference. Almost 50 states have, have had some kind of budget game. The big lesson that I've seen for most of these budget games is people don't realize how hard it is to balance the budget. Mo the average citizen thinks, oh, it's, why don't they get it together? These stupid politicians can't budget the, <laughs> balance the budget. Turns out, it's actually really hard. Um, and I think that that's, that's not a behavior change. It's more of like an, an understanding of how the issue should be approached that will affect how people vote and how they uh, put pressure on a, a politicians, what kind of policies they support. And so the, I, I think one of the most important things is, is putting the emphasis on what is the right kind of outcome immediately. Does it make them vote? Does it change this or that? But I think they're, they're, the kind of thing you're looking for is actually is buried in there if they suddenly have an appreciation for the fact that balancing the budget might be hard instead of easy. That, to me, is a huge outcome for a single game, especially a game experience that lasts for maybe half an hour. That's for behavior change out of half an hour, incredibly ambitious. So. But you know, what, what, I'm, what I'm hoping for and looking for is, what is so let's just say that increases understanding of how difficult it is, what the problems really are. Does that make them more open to messages about making changes? And so, you know, as somebody that's interested in, in change, I, I want to know can, can that work, really, is, is what I'm looking for on that. And this comes to my second question is, have you, is there much research or have you thought about much about how you target these? How do you get the right people to play these games if you're looking to change behavior? You know, you are, you know, we're, we're micro-targeting. We're looking at, at different stuff. So, are there strategies that you guys have looked at in terms of, of aiming games and getting people to play the certain games? So for the first question, the answer is yes. There is behavioral change data, depending on what particular sector you're talking about. But frankly, it's not very well funded. No one wants to hear that I'd like to do a longitudinal study. You're kind of thrown out the window at that point. <laughs> Especially when you throw on top of it that, and at the end of it, I really can't make strong causal claims. Because typically, you know, a lot happens in the life of, like, let's say one election cycle of six months, knowing what role the game played versus all the other yeah. inputs a particular citizen has. You know, you have to really couch your, but, but it's worth asking, and we ought to be holding our, our feet to that fire, I think. I mean, in my experience, they're either talking about learning, divorced from, and what was the doing, or doing, without thinking about what is the learning that you're doing. Mm -hmm. and, you know, changing behavior without changing minds to me feels a little bit Orwellian, but changing <laughs> minds without changing behaviors also feels a little bit self-indulgent. So we ought to ask these questions, you know, and I think it's a matter of setting the bar higher and enabling it. But again, keep in mind, you're asking for the kind of work that oftentimes it's hard to get funded. Um, the question was a good one. Too. The micro micro targeting. Okay, one small note. We really haven't talked about games and assessment and games and data analytics right now, which is really the hot topic. Mm -hmm. There's a ton that can be said in that world. Um, I think we have to be cautious but uh, optimistic. Um, but I will say that one really interesting thing that's coming out of just this massive push to digital type environments for things like learning and participation, et cetera, is that. 
and you get incredible data exhaust. And part of that data exhaust can tell you things like, this game works, but only for this demographic of population. Now, you've got constraints given on, like, what is your platform? Who are you able to reach? So who you actually hit is going to limit the kind of personalization you can do. But it is, um, it is yeah. a huge move right now to start thinking about how do you develop, I mean, you can develop one digital treatment that has multiple um, variations in it and can tailor itself based on the inputs of a particular person's choices, totally. right? So in the same way, let's go back to this original example. The feedback that we get is very different based on which choices we made. Mm. Let's say that we went ahead and what we, what we made the choices that we think ostensibly many of us would argue take the, you know, take the community college mm -hmm. course. Right, the information we get based on that choice is very different versus the information that we get based on, I'm not going to do that, I can't afford to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So even there you start to see sort of tailorizing, or tailoring, tailorizing, <laughs> <Tailoring. Tailoring>. um, <laughs> You know, so you start to see personalization, but on the back end of that is a ton of yeah. questions we could be asking about where is the right, like what are the venues in which people are, particularly youth and young adults, are already in, which context, like is it Facebook or MySpace or other sectors, and then what kinds of materials, how could we tweak it to make it far more um, meaningful to different subgroups, and yeah. before, that was just too expensive to yeah. do, and there was no way to gather the data on it, but right. now we kind of yeah. can. So even, this is a good segue, the, in the making money game, we did direct mail, so these bonds went out through the post, and we knew the zip codes that the bonds went to and where the person lived. And so we were able to see as bonds got redeemed which parts of the community were actually playing and becoming activated. And the parts that weren't, the kind of dark spots, we did, we kind of doubled down our investment, held events there, etc. So there was a way to be able to understand as the game was being played, how people were interacting. Just one additional note on this um, about the cost of assessment. Yeah. You can make a game, a budget game, because they've been done enough times. You say, I'm going to just duplicate the same mechanics and make it low budget. And maybe you find somebody who can do a lot of it for you. And you do some version of it that's $20,000. And you say, OK, it's not going to be the greatest game. People are maybe, it's not going to compete with a lot of things. It's going to be a very minimal game. OK, now we want to do a longitudinal study and see if it works. You could spend half a million dollars evaluating the game. Be ready to say that the cost of the evaluation could be much more than the actual intervention. I mean, it could, be, it could be vice versa. You could spend $5 million on a game, and you could see impact right away that's $10,000. So I think that there's just, what, this is really, uh, I think, especially for a funding community, to be thinking about that relationship between understanding how well something works and a game. It's not just add 10% on for evaluation, <laughs> especially with games. It's right. not, there isn't a recipe like that. This is a, a highly uh, innovative form. And sometimes, what the best kind of evaluation is, is the kind of learning that happens by building one. And you're going, to you're going to make your next one that much better. And your grantee may make the next game so much better than the first. And that's a, that's a really a hard challenge to try and understand where do, we, where do we invest in evaluation and assessment and the games, especially because there is so much data. It's tempting to say, we're going to have so much data, we can just measure and we'll know what it is. Yeah. But it's the, the, to know whether the data that's even coming out of the exhaust is necessarily the, the right one. Mm -hmm. So I think that this is just an area that's worth having really open conversations about mm -hmm. and resisting the temptation to say it's the 10% extra for evaluation. Mm -hmm. Do we have the resource that's for investing? Um, do we team? have the resource that's for investing? We, Constance put out a fabulous, a fabulous resource yeah, for yeah. what to think about in investing that is in a form that didn't fit on the slide. So we'll figure out a way that you can access that because it's really spot on. Um, I want to thank the panel for actually just taking the last word rather than my giving it to them. Um, and if you'll join me in thanking them. Um. Thank you.